Hopefully we can start. So good morning, everyone. I warmly welcome you in person and online. I'm Ivana Dremic from the European Newsroom, a collaborative project of around 20 news agencies from across Europe. MEPs just recently warned that foreign interference, disinformation and attacks on democracy were likely to increase in the run-up to the European elections in 2024. We believe that truthful reporting can counteract this. We are happy to host this press briefing today ahead of the June elections, which will set the course of the European Union in the years to come. Our speakers today are the European Parliament spokesperson, Jaume Duc, and the director for campaigns, and until recently, head of public opinion monitoring Philipp Schumeister, who will present the latest data of Eurobarometer. Questions can be raised after the presentation. So without further ado, I'm giving the floor to Jaume Duc. Thank you. So first of all, of course, good morning, uh, everyone. Thank you uh, very much for attending this uh, briefing uh, on the next European elections and on the results of this uh, last Parliament's uh, spring uh, uh, Eurobarometer. Mm, thanks, of course, to Belga and to the European Newsroom for uh, hosting uh, us this, uh, this morning. Yeah, as you know, the date uh, for the next uh, European elections mm, has just uh, recently been confirmed as uh, the 6th uh, to the 9th of uh, June 2024, so exactly uh, one year uh, from now. Yeah, in one year, people will get the opportunity to choose uh, the MEPs uh, to serve for the next five years from 2024 uh, to the end of this decade. Um, but maybe before entering into uh, the data of this Eurobarometer, let me uh, give the floor uh, uh, to the President of the European Parliament, Roberta Metzola. She cannot be with us today for this occasion. Uh, but uh, she recorded a, a video message that uh, we would like to, to, to share with you uh, now. Please, thank you. First time, all Europeans will be called to vote in the European Parliament elections, to make their voice heard and to pave the future of our Union, to stand up for all the issues which are important to all of us. The latest Europe barometer shows that interest in these elections is increasing. More people are interested and two out of three say that they would likely vote if the elections are held next week. Over the past years, we have experienced huge challenges, pandemic, war, energy crisis, inflation, disinformation, climate change. But we have delivered. Europe has provided solutions and Europeans appreciate this. The support for Ukraine remains high and two thirds say that they are optimistic about the future of Europe. Now is the time to work even harder, to deliver more, to reform and to regenerate. I call on everyone, and particularly our young people, to go and vote, to keep our democracies alive and to shape the European Union that we will live in. Don't let others decide. Vote. Well, it was a pretty clear message. Thank you. Um, so, um, as President said, uh, in a difficult uh, international context, elections at all levels uh, are more important than, than ever. We can never take uh, democracy for granted. Uh, we may think we live in uh, liberal democracies and that we are uh, protected uh, by the collective umbrella of the rule of law and fundamental rights, but cast your eyes around uh, Europe today and you will see uh, plenty uh, of examples of how democracy is being challenged internally or externally. The most important protection we have of our freedoms is the guarantee of elections every few years uh, at local, regional, national, and yes, why not, European level where our elected representatives are chosen by everyone uh, equally and fairly. Every layer of government um, has an impact on our everyday lives and every set of elected representatives are accountable uh, to the people uh, who elect them. Elections are a key part of our democracies, probably the key part. 
Of course, it's a responsibility to citizens uh, to use the right to vote if they wish, to influence the outcome, uh, but to make an informed choice, uh, they need uh, to know who the representatives are, what they do, uh, and whether they have made a difference. Representatives of the media have the vital role of reporting, analyzing, and digesting what the European institutions are doing and informing the public about uh, what has been decided, how, by whom, uh, so that they can then make uh, their own informed choice next year. And thanks, thanks for this, thanks for your role. This uh, Eurobarometer survey contains some traditional questions concerning the image of the EU in the eye of public opinion and the priorities that people think we should be uh, focusing uh, on, but it also contains uh, an indication of respondents' awareness of and interest in uh, the uh, next uh, European uh, elections. One of the strengths of this survey, by the way, is that it can be compared with the one that we carried out before the previous elections in 2018. Let me maybe underline a couple of elements before uh, Philip uh, takes the floor for a more complete presentation. Three major figures. I would like to underline 71%, 61%, 69%. 61%. After Brexit, the pandemic, and now the war in Ukraine, and the leading role that the EU has played uh, in this crisis or because of this crisis, 71% of respondents recognize the impact of the EU actions on their lives. Positive impact, negative impact, this is to people uh, to decide as for each kind of election uh, and each kind of uh, political level. Um, you don't vote because you agree or you disagree, you vote because you know that uh, you can make an impact. Another significant finding is that 61% of citizens think it's positive to be part of the EU. 27% think it's neither a good nor a bad thing. And only 11% say that it's a bad thing being a member of the European Union. And remember that before uh, Brexit in some countries, percentages uh, of acceptance in some of these countries were below uh, 50%. After more than a year, after the war started, now 69% of citizens think the EU is doing the right things in helping Ukraine. So the war fatigue is not apparent, at least not in the polls. And what about the European elections? The figures coming from this survey are, I would say, overall quite good, uh, better than one year before uh, the last uh, elections. And they are probably the logic consequence of the increased uh, visibility of the EU, the, the visibility that the EU has achieved uh, during this uh, legislature. 67% of citizens say they would vote if the elections were held next week. Of course, we know that uh, we cannot take this, this figure for granted, but, but in 2018, this same um, figure was much lower, was 58%, and turnout was 51%. Now, um, the interest is nine points bigger than in 2018. Let's expect this increase will be there as well during the elections night depending, of course, on what will happen during this last year of the legislature. And maybe a last reminder, or for journalists, people who didn't follow elections four years ago, in 2019, turnout increased eight point, at eight points from the 42% of 2014 to 50.5%. In other words, 20% more voters than during the previous elections with increases in 20 out of the 28 member states at that time. And maybe just one last message. Maybe you know that this week on Friday and Saturday, we will hold in Strasbourg the European Youth Event, gathering 10,000 uh, youngsters coming from all member states, most of them uh, first voters. Uh, 
Philippe today, but uh, with more details next Friday in Strasbourg, we'll, we'll also develop, uh, present some uh, figures about what we could expect from young people, and more important or more interesting, what young people uh, can expect or would like to expect from the European Union and the European Parliament. So thank you very much. Uh, and now, of course, the floor goes to Philippe Schulmeister. Thank you very much, Jaume, and uh, again to the European Newsroom and Belga, thank you very much for hosting us today. So, now, very complicated thing for a male person, I have two things to hold at the same time. Um, it works. Excellent. So, what I will going to do is to take you through some of the core results of the Spring Eurobarometer of the European Parliament. As of the end of this briefing, the whole data set with the full report, the national fact sheets, and uh, including the microdata will be published on the Eurobarometer website. So that means you will have immediate and full access, not only to this presentation, but to the whole underlying data that we are having. Um, the, as is always the case, Eurobarometer surveys are run as a face-to-face -face survey in all 27 member states. Um, the field work was in March of this year, 2nd to 26th of March. Uh, overall sample size, slightly more than 26,000 respondents with an age bracket of 15 years and older. And as a reminder, EU average results in the Eurobarometer are always weighted according to the size of the population of each country. I'll take you through three different elements. The first one, with a view to the European elections, awareness, interest, at, uh, likelihood, propensity to vote in the European elections 24. The second, life in the European Union, we focus on democracy and on the standard of living. And the third, citizens' perception of the EU and the European Parliament. One year before the European elections 24, and uh, as jean Duc did before, let me take you briefly back to 2019. As a reminder, since 1979 until the last European elections, turnout was continuously decreasing from one European election to the next until in 2019 we registered this increase of eight points to 50 point six. The turnout at that point in time had increased in 19 of the 27 EU member states. It is maybe also important to note that in some countries such as Spain or Germany, concurrent national or regional elections might have driven important increases in turnout in these countries but also in countries without any concurrent national election, uh, turnout increase was partly very, very significant. If we are now looking at the awareness of the next European elections, very simple entry question. Do you know that there will be European elections? And if so, when? The options would be this year, 23, next year, any month, 24, May or June 24, so specific, or in two years, in two years' time. And what we can say is that already compared to autumn 22, our last Eurobarometer survey with this question, we have an increase of nine percentage points to 45% who know the elections will take place next year. 28% today already know the exact date as in April or, sorry, May or June 2024, in itself an increase of nine points compared to 2018. So first point of what I would like to show, indeed people know that something is going to happen, that the European elections are coming, and they know to a higher degree than they did in five years ago. When we're looking at the interest in the European elections, so we know they're coming, we know when they will take, does it interest me? Yes, it does, and to a higher degree than we had in 2018. 56% today would say, I'm interested in these European elections, plus of six percentage points compared to five years ago. And the youth interest, 
which is very interesting for us also, equally increases by 6% from 43% to 49% in 2023. So again, from the point of interest, a very, a very promising starting position, at least for the political discourse and debate that is to be had over the next year. And this rise in interest we can see across all EU member states, increasing in 25 member states only in Cyprus and Slovakia. I see a small, relatively small decrease in interest, highest interest, Netherlands, Ireland, Germany, Sweden, Finland and Malta. And the largest increases overall I would have in Latvia, in Italy, Poland, Belgium and uh, Greece by up by 10% and more. Also here you see it again with the spread starting with Netherlands, Ireland, Germany, Finland and Malta and ending uh, Greece, uh, Slovenia, Bulgaria, France, Czech, Czechia and Slovakia at the other end of the spectrum. Voting propensity. Question, if the next European elections were held next week, how likely would you be to vote in these elections on a scale from 1 to 10, 1 being not likely at all, 10 very likely. We group this in likely, not likely and neutral. 7 to 10 would say they are very likely, likely to go to vote, 67%, not likely. 17% uh, and 15 have a neutral assumption to this. We had a similar question back in 2018. The wording was not exactly the same. The meaning was, but the wording was not the same. So methodologically, we cannot directly compare. But nevertheless, 9 percentage points higher likelihood to vote than compared to 2018. Again, this is not the turnout on voting day itself, the 9th of May 2024. But if 2018 and the figures that we had were any indication to what we saw in 2019, I would say awareness, interest, likelihood to vote is, as I said, a good starting point. Because six percentage points more than 2018 say it's important to vote in the European Parliament elections. Low importance goes down, medium importance goes down, high importance increases. So all that tells the story. People know it's coming, they're interested in it, they find it important and necessary to go to vote. Why? First reason, it's their duty as citizens. And that fits into the overall democracy narrative. Democracy is seen by citizens for years now as one of the key values of the European Union, specifically in the context of the past years, safeguarding democracy as a priority for the European Parliament, as a key value for the European election, also reflected here in this standard indicator uh, that we are asking in every, each of our service. Life in the EU, democracy and the standard of living. Democracy remains the first value that your Parliament should defend in priority team. And now, sorry, okay, threw me a little bit. 37% say democracy should be the first value the European Parliament should defend. Followed by protection of human rights in the EU and worldwide, freedom, speech and thought, and the rule of law. You see, over the past year, and even if we go a little bit further back, there is not much movement here. Democracy is and always has been one of the core values together with human rights and the freedom of speech and the rule of law always have been in the top range of our value questions. We asked following aspects, a series of different aspects of democracy in the European Union and the satisfaction of citizens when it comes to this. Free and fair election comes out with 70% as the most important aspect of democracy in the European Union, 
followed by freedom of speech and the possibility for citizens to participate in political life. But I would be amiss not to mention media diversity and the rule of law. These are the top five elements, aspects of democracy. People would say they are the most satisfied with in the European Union. This is something also that has been mentioned before. Over three quarters of Europeans continue to approve the European Union's support to the Ukraine. That is, in the overall context also of the economic development, cost of living rise over the past year, a crucial and core message. There is no, at least not in this survey, there is no war fatigue. On the, on the, on the contrary, we even have a plus of three percentage points since autumn 22, who say they strongly support the European, European Union support to the Ukraine. You will also find in the survey report a geographical uh, representation where the different countries stand on these questions. Sweden, Finland, Netherlands, Portugal and Denmark in the top five with Ireland and Lithuania coming in above 90% support for what the European Union is doing in this area. Lowest at the under end, Slovakia, Greece with 51%, Bulgaria 54, 58, 61, then to Austria. That would be the spectrum as we see it. And this increasing or stable support for the support for Ukraine is important also in this context. Because half of respondents consider that their personal standard of living has already been reduced or will reduce over the next year. 29% say has not yet happened, but I think that this will be the case over the next year. So there is these two elements to the story. The citizens see and feel on the one hand that the crisis has an impact on their personal life, on their standard of living, but it does not impact negatively on the support that the European Union is giving for Ukraine. It does not impact negatively on how they see democracy in the European Union. And as we will see a little bit further on, it does not impact negatively on the opinion, on the way they see, on the image they hold of the European Union and uh, the, the value of being a member of the European Union. 71% say the European Union's action have an impact on their daily life. Yes, very clearly also not asked whether this is a positive or a negative impact. It has an impact. We feel that what the European Union does impacts my life. It's for the polit political side to argue what kind of impact it is, whether this is good or bad. But the impact is there. And we see this with a relatively slow, uh, small spread across the European Union from 87% in Cyprus and Malta down to 60% in Bulgaria, Estonia, Italy and Latvia who say, yes, there is an impact on my life by what the European Union is doing. In this context, media recall of the European Parliament. Have you recently read, seen, television or heard on the radio something about the European Parliament? 62% yes, 38% no. And in general, 56% say what they have seen, read or heard has given them a generally favorable impression of the European Parliament. And now, this associate from the figure just before, what's important to me is, and this you will see in all the standard indicators when it comes to image of the European Union and the European Parliament, there is no significant, statistically significant impact of what has happened over the past two, three years on the image of the European Parliament or the image of the European Parliament. 
uh, the, the European Union. So again, to bring it together, they feel that something is happening, they feel it on the personal standard of living, the support to the European Union stays the same, the support to the European, uh, to, the, to the action in the Ukraine stays the same, and the interest in the European election goes up. Here, we have a decrease in the Parliament's role from 63 to 54, but again, we're staying more or less within the range that we have since the last European elections. And the positive perception of the EU membership remains stable with 61% since autumn 22. And actually, if you look at it already, quite some time longer. I'm ending on this slide, optimism for the future of the European Union. It's a little bit the spring message of the spring survey, if you want. Seven point increase in optimistic when it comes to the future of the European Union and the decrease of 7% uh, when it comes to I'm pessimistic, without the pessimistic about the future of the European Union, which closing the circle makes the interest in the European elections 24 rising up. I thank you very much. My team is here. The data will be online more or less as we speak. We're ready for your questions, also to answer going down into national, uh, national specificities. If you have them, again, with my team, thank you very much. So thank you very much for the input. These are quite interesting data. I'm sure there are some questions about it. So, um, yeah, we will start taking questions here in the room, but also you can raise your questions online. Um, so, Irene, yeah, you can go ahead already. Thank you, Irene Zakadula with uh, Athens News Agency and Greek Public TV. Well, do you feel that uh, is there any harm to the European Parliament because of the scandals? And can the European citizens feel uh, confident that Following the next mandate, the European Parliament is uh, stronger to fulfill its goal. Thank you. If you look to the figures, you don't see this, uh, let, let's call it, Catergate effect. Uh, it's not there. Um, what does it mean? Uh, this is uh, for the media to, to analyze and to decide. And of course, what is important is what will happen during the next year ahead of the European elections and how the Parliament will react during these next months. You know that uh, since uh, December last year, President Metzola has been pushing uh, a lot, all kind of internal reforms, uh, and I hope, and I think that this is also the hope of the majority of the members of the parliament, that this line will be followed and continued until the last day <coughs> of the legislature. If I may add one data point to that, then I would put you, point you towards the last standard Eurobarometer published by the Commission uh, earlier this year. Um, there you will always find the trust in the European institutions, the various one, Commission, Council and Parliament also there. And this is relevant because it was taken exactly in the timely context of uh, Qatargate. There you will also find that there is no measurable impact on the trust in the European Parliament. And when it comes to image of the European Parliament, you have seen that also on a EU average basis, I would not see it. If you go down to national figures, you will see punctual, in your case, for example, there might be an impact, but overall there is not. Please, and state which media and country you're reporting from. Hi. Uh, Mark Burley from AFP. Uh, going through the executive summary, which has a little bit of a narrative angle different to what you've presented here, I, I see that 61% um, say the overall situation, life democracy in Europe, is going in the wrong direction. And um, uh, basically a large amount of people, particularly in France, think that basically things are going badly. It seems to me that... Um, You've got uh, democracy, rule of law, all those ideals have strong backing, definitely, but 
standard of living, a concrete thing that the voters are feeling, very much weighs on the electorate. Can you talk to that, what th those figures are showing? And also, if that is more likely to perhaps result in radical voting posture, perhaps more radical results, uh, MEPs more radical in attacking that problem. Thank you. Um, had I talked about each of the questions that is in this survey, we would be sitting here in one and a half hours still and I wouldn't be done. But as I said before, the whole set of the questions and the answers broken down by country and social demographics is online. So, um, yes, and I tried to very clearly also show this by putting up the impact on the standard of living. There is a significant part of the population that says what happens right now doesn't make me happy. That's the question that are in, the, in which direction are things going both in my country and in the European Union. The impact on the standard of living, all that weighs indeed heavily on people. But my point is that the logical conclusion from that would be I am losing trust that the European level, now for that matter, will be capable to deliver. And this is what we are not seeing. And this is what, for me, is really important also to point out. Citizens see very clearly how much they have left in their purse at the end of the month. And France is clearly one of the countries that shows this in a more striking way, maybe, than other countries. But at the same time, there is hope, there is an increase in optimism, there is an expectation that the European Union will be able to deliver. And that is, that is maybe the one point that I would like to add to it. This is not a story of everything is well and good. This is a story of expectation and also of learned trust. For me, the story of, or for us, when we are looking at the Eurobarometer data coming back from 2011 and 12, image of the European Union, role of the European Union, uh, benefit of being a member, good thing, bad thing, all these indicators increase continuously since 2011, 2012, since the economic and financial crisis, throughout every single crisis point since then. Brexit, mig migration crisis, Brexit, COVID, and the war. Most interesting, a plus of 10 percentage points image of the European Union between November 2019 and November 2020. No one thought, or many people thought, in the beginning of 2020, that the European Union might not be able to deliver. That was the talk. And then it came, both with Repower EU and uh, with the vaccination rollout. And public opinion followed on that one. So my point here is, it's a question of expectation that is expressed here. People expect the European layer level to deliver. European Parliament, European Commission, European Union is delivering so far. The satisfaction is not where we want it to be. And it's clearly also expressed in the data. But the positive expectation is there. Thank you. We have a question online. So Tom Weingartner, you can raise your question and please just state which media and country you're reporting for. We can't hear you. Can you say something? Okay. Can yeah. you hear me now? Yes. Now we okay. can hear you. Okay. Um, I'm a bit surprised that you didn't find out any impact of this cutter gate. Could you perhaps uh, explain us how did you find out this? Did, did you ask people 
we don't care about, uh, and they told you that we don't care about uh, Cartagate, or what What did you do to find out whether this has an impact on the image of the parliament? Thank you. Um, in the context of this survey, we had the question, image of the European Parliament, uh, image of the European Parliament, role of the European Parliament combined with the trust, um, uh, combined with the trust uh, in the European Parliament and the institutions as the standard uh, Eurobarometer of the Commission has seen it. Uh, I haven't seen, except in the first few months, few weeks of the year, January, I haven't seen any national or otherwise surveys that would have shown a significant and lasting impact of the Qatar Gaid situation on the image of the European Union or the European Parliament as such. And the data that we are having in the survey today also doesn't show this. Yes, please. Uh, just say your name and media. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Igor Juric, uh, Slovenian National Television. Question regarding the support uh, for Ukraine. Uh, if I uh, see here, uh, you find out that Sweden and Finland have the highest level of approval on one side. On the other side are countries like Slovakia, uh, Bulgaria, Ch uh, Czech Republic, and so on. So the countries which are very close to Ukraine the support is the lowest. On the other side, uh, let's say Nordic countries, very high. Is this maybe has anything to do with the living standard? First of all, it's not necessarily the proximity to Ukraine that matters. And I would say in the case of the Nordic countries is the proximity to Russia that matters to a certain degree also. Uh, living standards might be a reason, and let's not forget uh, none of these questions that, uh, these, that surveys have have monocausal answers. So it's not either the proximity to the Ukraine or to Russia for that matter, or the living standards. But range of factors, political discourse in a country vis-a-vis -vis the situation on the ground might play a role here too. Uh, and you might see this very well reflected not only in the results the country, from the countries that you have just been quoting, but also with a number of other countries. Yes, please. Hi, it's Jovita Kivnik from Deutsche Welle Polish office. I wanted to ask if overall, don't you think that the still numbers are low? It's only 45% of citizens are aware, um, aware of elections next year. 56 is eager to vote. In the last year, Europe, years, European Union was very active in many fields, like you said. So don't you think it's low? And my second question is, what should be done to make people more interested in the elections? We have one year. Yeah, maybe uh, first thing is that uh, this survey uh, took place in March this year. So at that time, uh, it was impossible to know uh, the exact date of the European elections because it wasn't decided, you know, that it was decided two weeks ago. So I would say it was quite a tricky question for many citizens. Second, I think that this is the normal uh, way of uh, looking to politics. The closer these elections will come, more and more people will be interested and more and more people will know. I wouldn't say that it's surprising that one year before or two years before, 50% or more than 50% of people know already that the European elections are coming. But of course we know, and I mean, we are not going to discuss this, that these elections competing with national elections or with local or regional elections are different for many reasons. But what is important for us, or at least what we see as a lesson of this uh, Eurobarometer, and is that there is a positive trend if you compare with the last European elections, 2019, and the situation one year before, 2018, there is a positive trend. What's the explanation of this trend? Probably it's because of what happened during these last four years. It's because of the increase of the visibility of the European Union in these last four years because of Brexit, because of pandemic, the vaccines, 
next generation, uh, the certificate, and of course because what's happening now with the uh, aggression with the, uh, the Russian war in uh, Ukraine. And um, this is also something that we can test uh, looking to media. If you take the, let's say, the the percentages and the amount of presence of the European Union in the media, the European media now also compared with uh, five, four years ago, there has been a huge increase. And not just uh, in a quantitative point of view, also in a qualitative one. M many more top pages and many more first news. And this, of course, increases the interest in the Union. Now the question is how do you transfer this interest from, yes, I'm interested in what happens in the Union because I understand that it has an impact on me, on my people, on my family, uh, etc. in, yes, I will vote or no, I don't vote uh, next elections or what I'm going to vote, which, of course, it's not uh, the element uh, here. Uh, what are we going to do in the next year? I would say two things. One, of course, we will run, as it was the case, quite successful, by the way, in 2019, uh, an awareness campaign, communication campaign, but, but we know that those who really can mobilize or not mobilize people for voting or abstaining are politicians and media. These are the two main factors. When politicians, political parties, and media are interested in elections, people tend to be elected in ele uh, interested in elections. When the media, for any reasons, or the politicians themselves are not or are less than in other occasions, this can come with an impact. But when you see the whole political debate in the European Union, in the institutions, around the institutions, and in the member states on European affairs, and when you see that right now it's completely impossible to distinguish, to make, a, let's say, a split between national politics and European politics, on migration, on development, on economics, on gender equality, on almost everything, of course, starting by peace in Ukraine, uh, or, or by health or how to protect the health of citizens, this will come with an impact. And this is what we are seeing. What will happen in the next year, in some way, I would say, it will depend on many factors, including ourselves in this room. Thank you. We have another question here in the second row. Yeah. Um, no, it should be on. Okay. Yeah. Um, it's Andy Bounds from the Financial Times. Um, you mentioned Brexit a few times, but also, Philip, I think you said from 2011 this trend of approval is, has, has been consistent. So I just wonder whether Brexit had had indeed any impact on approval of the EU with the, with the remaining member states. Is there any evidence that's been found? If you're looking at the long-term trends, image of the European Union and the other associated fundamental indicators that we are asking, I would say yes, indeed. But the key impact, in my view, was in the heads and minds of the people seeing what happened and drawing conclusions from that, that it would be better, clearly, apparently, to be in than out. And this is something that contributed, and we saw this in 2016, we saw this in 2019 again, in the individual data throughout the countries, that yes, Brexit had this impact on how people see, how citizens see the European Union. You might even go a step further and says that certain political narratives that might have been present in a number of countries until the exit of the United Kingdom very quickly disappeared afterwards. So yes, I would say there was a positive impact on how people see it. Yeah, maybe it would be interesting to go back to the surveys in second half of 2016 until 2018. Because there the impact is quite visible, if I remember well, uh, in those countries where there was a discussion about in or out. And there were increases of 10, even 15 points in the level of acceptance of citizens in countries as Sweden uh, or the Netherlands uh, or Finland. So maybe the impact was not uh, as big as, for example, I mean, I mean, the, the impact was not very big in Spain or in Portugal or in countries that historically have been always been in favor of being members. But in those countries where there was a discussion, and sometimes the figures were 
almost 50-50, this impact came, and it came mostly during the first months and the first two years after the referendum, not after Brexit, but after the referendum. Thank you. Um, are there any more questions? Ah, in the back. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm Katalin Neut from Hungarian Public Radio. I would like to ask you, uh, have you any question about party preferences? And if not, why not? Eurobarometer, <laughs> it's an interesting question insofar as uh, I was always very interested in having this. And uh, as Max Weber once said, politics is the drilling of very, very thick boards. Um, the Eurobarometer was always, and rightly so, uh, has to be politically neutral. I do believe that uh, the European Parliament could benefit and the members from having a party preference question. So I think we might be working towards having one before the European elections. Can't promise anything on that basis, but it would be very interesting, I would say. So I do not see any more questions also online. If you want to raise a question, please just make use of the um, raise hand function. Um, maybe I have a question. I mean, these elections will be very important. We all know that. And as the Eurobarometer says, I mean, um, it's a quite optimistic um, exception, like expectation on it. So um, what's your strategy in, in communicating about the importance about the European election and to get people to vote? Um, we spoke earlier about disinformation, about foreign interference. Um, yeah. Well, as I said before, we are right now preparing our communication uh, strategy. I will always avoid the word campaign, our communication strategy. Uh, on how to help citizens to understand the importance of these European elections and how to link these European elections, not just to what happened during these last years, but um, mostly and more important, what will happen in the next five, even 10, 15 years, because this is the kind of elections that uh, impacts not only in the legislature, but in some way also in the next legislatures, depending which kind of decisions uh, are going uh, to be uh, taken. This year, 2023, for the, for the European Parliament is the year of delivery. This is the year and also the next first months of 2024 where the Parliament will have to cope with more or less 200 legislative proposals which are right now in the pipeline. Some of them will be adopted, some not, depending on the level of priority and of course also depending uh, on uh, the possibility of getting an agreement between both the Parliament and the Council. You know that sometimes it's easier to find this agreement within the Parliament, sometimes it's difficult, sometimes it's even impossible to get this uh, consensus or this agreement or this majority or sometimes unanimity uh, within the Council. So we'll see how far the European Parliament and can go in this delivery because at the end of the day, and this is also something which uh, is shown by many surveys, this trust or this positive image depends in many cases on whether there is an answer or not. And voting and who you are going to vote and if you are going to radicalize or not your vote many times also depends on uh, your perception about how big this delivery was uh, or was not. And then during the last part uh, of our communication strategy, so the three, four months before the European elections, it will be what we call the go to vote campaign, which in fact it's, yes, a civic and institutional campaign to promote participation. Uh, linked, of course, to the role of the European Union. And from this point of view, I would say that this strategy will be easier than five years ago, but there are, because there are many more examples of the impact in the life of the citizens. And then at some point, obviously, preparing the ground for the real actors, who are the European political parties, the national political parties, the members of the European Parliament, uh, and the candidates. Uh, we'll see how these things are evolving next year. Of course, there is also a question mark, and I, I'm almost surprised that this question didn't come here 
about the Spitzenkandidaten, for example. Today we saw the Greens, yesterday we saw the Greens announcing officially that they are going uh, to, uh, to present, uh, to enter into an internal uh, process uh, to select uh, their own or, or yeah their own candidate or candidates to the presidency of the commission this is something that is going maybe to create a lot of extra interest here in brussels and hopefully also uh, in many member states thank you very much we have a question online so daniel weber uh, from luxembourg you can raise your yes, question sir, this is Yes, hello, this is Tanya with the Luxembourgish Public Radio. I just have a question, a follow-up uh, on what you just said on the party preferences. You said we might have that in the future. Maybe you can explain um, the procedure to change that. Uh, who will decide and, um, you know, how long would that uh, take uh, to take such a decision? Maybe you can explain the process a bit here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, the whole procedure is intrinsically linked to uh, what the European Parliament is going to do uh, during election night. Uh, those of you who have been around in uh, 2019 will remember the European Parliament will be, has been and will be the place where you will get not only all the 27 national election results, but out of that one during election night, um, the aggregated European result uh, for the next European Parliament. In order to understand, in order to prepare for what is going to happen on election night, in order to enable us to assess the data as it's coming in, starting from turnout uh, with the different projections throughout the evening, uh, it is important to have a very close eye on polls, voting intention surveys that are going to be published between now and the European elections. Now, this is, to say it floppily, a mixed bunch when it comes to quality. There are countries who are, will be publishing uh, five European election voting intention polls uh, every week. Uh, there will be other countries where there is not a single one between now and the European elections, which makes an aggregated prediction and understanding of the political situation complex and difficult. Having, you're using the Eurobarometer with its unified methodology throughout all 27 member states as a tool to understand voting intentions might be something that could very much help us on this way, and this is a decision that will be taken over the next months until early autumn uh, by the hierarchy in the House. Thank you. I don't see, oh, there's one more question. Okay, then. Hi, uh, Marie Deskep from the Belgian news agency Belga. I just wanted to know if you could uh, remind us why it's so important to have the young people on board for this election. Uh, the question would be why not? Uh, I mean, uh, first of all, um, Philip uh, shown to you uh, the progress that uh, we started to, to get to see in 2019 in terms of uh, participation turnout. There is one figure, which is 50.5%, more or less, almost 51%. This was uh, the overall uh, percentage of uh, turnout in 2019. But, of course, behind this figure, there are other figures. Um, young people voted less than average. First voters, so from 18 and in a couple of countries, 16 or 17, to 25 years old European citizens voted less than average. But there was an important increase. I would say it was a, a bigger increase than the average one. Why? Because in 2014, only 28% of these first voters really voted, 28% in 2014. Five years later, in 2019, this figure moved from 28 to 42%. 
okay, it's still less than 50, and it's still less than the average, but from 28 to 42, there is a difference. Explanations for this uh, increase, there are many. Um, if you go to literature on this, you will find a lot of uh, data, country by country, which implies that this was linked, for example, to climate change, uh, to uh, mobilizations among young people, including street demonstrations uh, during several months before the European elections. This was maybe more evident in some countries than in others. Now the question is uh, whether we will see again an increase in uh, young people voting or not. And of course, for us, the institution, the parliament, but maybe this should be even bigger than just the parliament, this is uh, a priority for many reasons. And maybe the first reason is that these are probably the elections that are more clearly shaping future for these new generations. Uh, because at the end of the day, what will happen at the European level will probably have a bigger and a longer impact than national decisions, uh, let's say, year by year or in the short term. And then there is also, I would say, an institutional a duty which is linked to the fact that most times people who start, I mean, people who get the possibility to vote because they get the age for voting and don't vote, many of them could develop a kind of abstention trend uh, all over their lives. People who start voting or who vote the first time that they have the possibility of voting uh, will in many cases also keep, let's say, this uh, habitude, this uh, tradition or this custom of voting. So from this point of view, it's also uh, very uh, uh, important. But uh, we will see what will happen. And don't forget that this time there are two more countries. One is Belgium and the other one is Germany, where the decision was taken to lower the voting age to 16 years old, which means that right now there are people who I wouldn't say are young people. I would say they are teenagers 15 years old right now or 14 years old and 15 in one week will have the possibility to vote for the first time in the European elections. Thank you very much. Um, there are no questions left. I also don't see any online. So thank you for your input. Um, and it's quite interesting data. The data are now also online. Here in the room, we have handouts. Um, and yeah, thank you for attending and have a nice day. Thank you very much.